Picciotti, picciotta, andiamo in cucina. This is Sicilian for ladies and gentlemen, come to the kitchen. Today we're going to make red wine sauce, an old classic made easy. Steak au pois with scalloped potatoes and arugula served with red wine sauce. Another great classic dish, salmon with sauteed Brussels sprouts and red wine sauce. And learn how my fondness for the art of plating is my wife's sacrifice. Come for the recipes, stay for the story. The French call it mirapois. As Italians, we call it soffritto. Plus, we look cuter because we move our hands like this. If you're an Italian, when you're born, you got a kind of a DNA that doesn't let you talk and not move the hands at the same time. You gotta talk, you gotta move like this. So a Frenchman will say, mirapois. An Italian guy will say, it's soffritto. You see the way the hands move? That's a thing. That's the thing that makes us different. Ultimately, the ingredients are the same. Carrots, celery, and onion the triumvirate, which is at the base of every sauce that's made by anyone. It's just, and this is my opinion, it sounds cuter in Italian. On the other hand, if you were to ask me again, it even tastes better in Italian. Yeah, it does. One of the great trips that I took with my family when I was uh, barely a teenager uh, was going to France. It was very exciting for me. I wanted to eat, I wanted to try French food. I remember this one time, uh, this uh, fancy restaurant that my dad took me, my brother, and my mom. And for the first time, I had steak uh, with red wine sauce. It became my mission that I had to figure out how to make this sauce. And this sauce was a disastrous series of attempts that started as early as me at the age of 18, all the way into my early 30s until I developed the perfect understanding on how to make the most delicious red wine sauce. It is something that I love and adore, and it's something that you can make at home with very basic technique, and as simple as one, two, three. Let me show you how. Making a red wine sauce, it's like directing an orchestra in the making of a concert. What am I saying? Each one of the ingredient has a purpose. Each one of the ingredient has a role. And this role adds to the sauce in a specific fashion. Let's get started first with uh, the pancetta. Uh, the reason why I like pancetta, you could use bacon if you don't have pancetta, is because I find that pork is something that brings an incredible turn for the best to the flavor of the sauce as a whole. I like to cook it and let it render. Don't worry about the excessive fat because one of the things that we're going to do afterwards, once the sauce has cooked all the way through, I'm going to show you how to actually get the fat out of the sauce. You don't need to cook it too long. You have to wait enough so that it starts to brown a little bit because the making of the sauce primarily is a long braise. Now we are at the point in which the next thing that we want to add is the il soffritto. What is the soffritto? Very simple. We have onion, carrots, celery. You don't need to be too elegant in the way in which you cut it, as a matter of fact. At this point, you notice that I'm not adding any pepper and salt because there's an enormous amount of that already into the uh, pork that I've used, the pancetta in this case, heavily salted. All that I want to do right now is just to get them to sweat a little bit and to brown up. One of the things that I came to realize is the importance of caramelization. In this case, I'm not adding salt or pepper. This is just a touch of sugar that I want to add and make sure that it's coating each one of the ingredients in there because the sugar right now fighting against the salt in the pork pretty soon will create the perfect combination of ingredients. But I'm not finished. There's another bit here that you're going to love. This is tomato paste. I find that used in this fashion blooms, opens up. It gives to the sauce a breath. It's like the sauce stands proud. It just discovered a whole new horizon to it. And I find this to be very important. Traditionally speaking, the herbs that you should add to this are bay leaves. I've done it with bay leaves and it tastes fantastic. But there is a, a little stillinism that I like even more. And that, that is the addition of a little bit of rosemary. This is rosemary from my garden up front. A couple of pieces that I love to add in there and just one more element, one more note 
bit of the only thing that I'm upset about is that this does not have smell vision because if you could only feel the aromas as they're opening up. The next thing that I like to do is to add garlic. In this case, I like to add whole pieces of garlic. Don't worry about it because you're gonna strain all these ingredients afterwards, so don't be concerned by it. Look at what a color there is there already. This is the base. This is what's going to let the sauce sing. What I'm about to show you next is one more trick, and that's the addition of a little bit of flour. Why do we add the flour? We want the flour to cook so that the sauce will be thicker as the sauce cooks over a long period of time. And the next thing that we're going to do is, first and foremost, the addition of the red wine. What red wine? Burgundy, would be great. Uh, Cabernet, Pinot Noir, Merlot. You choose the wine that you want. Ultimately, the wine that you choose will give the sauce a different flavor, but it will not make it bad. There's not only one wine that's great. The one thing that I would propose is don't use the best wine that you have, stuff that costs you two, three hundred dollars a bottle. Enjoy the one and drink it. Use, you know, average wine for this. And the next thing that I like to do is add chicken stock. Why? I'm going to use this particular wine sauce for several things. And I find that the chicken stock has this ability of playing nice with everybody. When you do this at home, you bring this to a boil. Once this reaches a boil, I want you to reduce it down to a simmer let the sauce cook, simmering for about an hour and a half, two hours. The sauce has cooked perfectly for almost two hours. We have strained the sauce, and then we have moved the sauce to a degreasing cup. Why? Do you remember before when I told you I'm gonna show you to get rid of the excessive oil? Here you can see the sauce right at top in this lighter color. This is all the fat that has accumulated. You need this instrument at home in order to be able to take the grease off. Watch what happens. As I pour this into the pan, the sauce comes out holding back the fat. The fat is the yellowish lighter color on top. The sauce is not yet to sauce consistency. That's why we're going to bring this to a boil. Once it reaches a boil, anywhere between 30 to 45 minutes on simmer, will give you the consistency that you're looking for. The sauce is reduced to the perfect consistency. I'm gonna turn it off, and now we're ready to plate. I don't believe in a time machine, but this sauce maybe is the closest thing that comes to a time machine. The fact that I was able on my own to repeat this performance that I saw as a child in this French restaurant in my first trip to France, this is more than a sauce. This is a realization of a dream. This is uh, an aspiration, but this, this is how you make red wine sauce. One of the things that was always told to me is the food, it's good. You put it on the plate and the food speaks by itself. I remember as a 10 year old having issues with my mother and the way she would plate the pasta. <laughs> Telling her how the sauce should actually be placed in a certain fashion, how the plate that she chose was the wrong plate. I don't know what happened to me. Why was it that I was so motivated? Uh, because my mom still to this very day, she cooks better than me. But the way in which the food always looked on the plate meant a great deal to me. When I think of making scalloped potatoes, I get excited because to me it's like making dessert. Uh, basically we have many layers of thinly cut potatoes that we separate with cheese. When we bake it, all this wonderful cheese and potatoes molding into one. But one of the most important things is to make sure that you grease the pan properly. So what we have in here is butter. You got to use your hands. There is no other tool that will work as good as your hands. And what I like to do is to spread it all over the pan so that the sides and the bottom of the pan are completely covered. Why do I do this? Even though this pan is a nonstick for flavor, pure and adulterated flavor. This flavor right here that the butter gives to the potato is gonna enhance them enormously. I cut these potatoes by hand with a knife. You can also use a mandolin, but if you do it with a mandolin, do me a favor, never be in a rush. When you're in a rush, that's when problems do occur. Uh, there is not a point for us to be overly taken by this, and especially since I cut these potatoes just about an hour ago, you notice that some of them are starting to turn. It will happen to you at home. Is this a problem? Not at all. Once they cook, they completely collapse. 
The one thing that I find important is the selection of the cheeses. What you will find today is that the basic cheeses that I use are part of the traditional way of doing it, which is the Swiss cheese, Gruyere, and Parmigiano. So here we have some uh, Swiss cheese that I've already put together and chopped up by hand. We're gonna sprinkle it right on top like this, and then you go with Parmigiano. And when you go with Parmigiano, you just use it. Then what I do at this point always is a little bit of salt and a little bit of pepper. The next thing that we're going to do is we create another layer, right? Here it is. Here we go with this, right on top of it. So here we go again with another big, abundant addition of my Gruvier. By the way, Gruvier is nothing more than another name for Swiss cheese. It tends to be a little bit sharper, and I like the Gruvier in the family of Swiss cheeses for the very, very reason. This is the top now. This is the one that you want to put all the extra cheese that you can, just like this. Remember, these potatoes, as they cook, they will fall on top of each other. And now we go again here. Parmigiano, molto parmigiano. Now, the last addition that we're going to make is very important. What we have in here is half and half. I've done this with milk only. I've done it with cream only. I find that half and half, which is basically a mixture, equal mixture of milk and cream, gives me the perfect rendition. So you add it, and how much do you add? Depending on the pan that you use, you wanna bring it at least three quarters of the way up. And there we are, this is the perfect amount that we have for this particular pan. The oven right now is preheated at 375 degrees. Sometime, I even preheat it to 400 degrees because you lose some heat once you open the oven. So the scalloped potatoes are ready, and the oven is preheated, and now I'm gonna place them into the oven. Maybe it's out of the oven, it's very, very hot. You will notice it's cooked all the way around. Now, most people like to dive right into it. Don't do that. What I propose that you do is that you let it rest, let it get to room temperature, then put it into the refrigerator, and let it rest overnight. Why? My opinion is that the flavors get even better. But what is the added advantage of letting it rest overnight? Let me show you. Take a look at this pan. Here are two pieces that I cut in perfect square. It makes it ideal when you want to serve it to your friends to sh basically cut it into whatever shape you want. And then using a pan, you can put it in the oven to reheat it. You don't need uh, any more than, I would say, 350, 375, between 10 and 15 minutes at the most, depending on the size of the piece. And this, this is how you make scalloped potatoes. The steak that we're using in this particular dish is a filet mignon. Now, when it comes on spicing the steak, you can do pretty much anything you want. Salt, pepper, onion, paprika, you know, whatever drives you, whatever you feel like painting, go your way. What I've done with this steak, I've done what's commonly known as upuar. Basically, I've taken peppercorns, I've crushed them, and then i rolled the steak until it's completely coated with it. So here we go. The important thing that you must do when cooking a steak, in a pan especially, is do not move it. When you take a look at a steak like this, the first thing that you want to have in your mind to kind of make an evaluation of, of how long it will take to take it where you want it to go is, how do you like your steak? Some people go, I like it medium rare, medium done, medium well, I like it well done. Well, some people like it well done, there's nothing you can do about it, it's the way it happens. But no matter how you like to have it, one of the things that you need to ensure is that the steak is perfectly cooked on each side. I see often uh, young chefs moving the steaks back and forth, back and forth. For the first four minutes at least, the steak has to sit in one position untouched. How long does it take for the steak to cook? A steak like this, we have it about a, an inch thick. I would say four minutes per side might take you to your medium rare. The steak is cooked perfectly on one side. We need to turn it to the other side. But I want to show you something. I want to tell you the reason why. I like to put a spatula underneath the steak, and as I turn the steak, it gives me complete control. More often than not, people simply flip it this way. What happens? If there's still a little bit of water in there, it's going to splash back. This allows you to avoid the splash back. But trust me when I tell you, it does help. It is at this point that I like to do something unique. Well, not so unique. It is the process known as arrosé. And I like to do it because 
it really gives us an additional layer of flavor that you haven't seen before. So a softened piece of butter is added to the hot oil. And then we're gonna use this butter to braise the steak with. And here we go. Why do we do this? Is that butter really needed? Well, I find that every time I use this technique, the steak for me almost has a sweeter flavor and I can taste the butter in just about every bite that I take. In this particular steak, because of the aggressiveness of the peppercorn, which we used as a coating on the outside of the steak, one of the things that I wanna do is add something that softens the flow of all the flavors attacking. Remember, we're gonna have this with a wonderful bit of arugula and also with the red wine sauce. This is something that allows me truly to combine all the flavors together as if colors within the context of a painting. We now have cooked the steak exactly to where I wanted to have it. But before we can serve it, we need to let it rest. The amount of time that you need to let this rest for is five minutes. So while the steak is resting, let me show you how to make the arugula. Cooking arugula is very, very simple, but you need to think where you want to take it and why. Arugula by itself already has a fairly intense flavor. It's very peppery, very salty, just naturally in the way in which it is. It doesn't need too much help. But what I'm about to show you is one thing that in my opinion makes it easy to cook it and at the same time imparts a great deal of flavor. It starts always with a little bit of red pepper flakes. So here we go. In the oil, we're now going to add the garlic. The oil is nice and hot. The garlic is chopped, as you can see, and you always see me adding big pieces of garlic, but not this time. This time I want this garlic to infuse the oil. As soon as the garlic starts to brown, immediately I lower it down to simmer, and I add the arugula right in it. And then you stir like this. Let the arugula cook in that. What's happening is the arugula is bringing down the temperature. It's wilting into it and it's becoming exactly what we love it. All the flavors are coming out together. This is fantastic, it's wonderful, I love it. And there we are. The arugula is perfectly sauteed, it's exactly what I love. Every bite that you will take of this will have all the flavors that you did not expect and the garlic really is going to be a fantastic addition. Turn off the heat, the arugula is ready, the meat is ready, the red wine sauce is ready, we're ready to plate. Let me show you how. Plating to some is simply placing the ingredients on the plate. Treat it as if it was an exercise in painting. Think of yourself as Caravaggio, as if you're painting the perfect chiaroscuro, where every element within the painting has a personality of its own. These dishes that you have cooked with so much care and so much love at this point become alive. Your passion seeps through with every bite that will be taken. And as people will sit around the table, drinking their wine, smiling, telling the story, taking the bites of your food, you will know you have made it happen. Here it is. That's how you make steak au poivre with red wine sauce, saute arugula with garlic, and scalloped potatoes. I would like to say that I had aspirations of becoming the Caravaggio plating, uh, being able to place all the pieces of a dish, of a recipe in the dish in such a form that would be so simple they would look almost as if it just happened, and yet so involved where the process of the simplicity was a great deal of thinking for height, width, color. My wife is highly bothered by that because I still do it to this very day, and in spite of the fact that it's just the two of us, it takes me forever to play it. In the early 80s, one dish that became very, very popular here in the United States was salmon with red wine sauce. More often than not, it was served in French restaurants, which at the time I used to go a great deal to. But every time I would actually have it, I would say, I have an idea on how to make it better. I have an idea on how to make it better. Until my wife said to me, look, if you think you're so much better, why don't you learn how to do it? <laughs> she should not have said that. It took a long time for me to eventually master this dish, but I'm going to share with you how to make this unique dish that actually puts together fish and red wine. Let me show you. First, we get to make the Brussels sprouts. In the pan, we already have some olive oil, which is nice and hot. Sicilian style always add red pepper flakes just because I like it to get nice and hot and spicy. And then we add our bacon. 
You can use any kind of bacon you want. I find that artisanal bacon, it's always the best. It has more flavor, it has a better personality. And it really tells the story, the kind of story that ultimately allows you, when this dish is completed, to have all these different elements of flavor. Every ingredient that you can upgrade, it's like elevating the tone in which you tell your story. I want to cook it until they just start to brown. And the reason why I cut it like this is to give it a look of lardons, which is a French name for this particular cut of bacon. The Brussels sprouts, we have treated uh, slightly different. Uh, we have sliced them thin. Why are we doing that? Well, Brussels sprouts, pretty resilient. It's one of those veggies that <laughs> has a personality and a strength of its own. We really need to break it down. I'm gonna increase it to high heat. At this point, another addition that I like to make just to give it another element of flavor is a little bit of chopped garlic. Bean chopped. If we add it at the beginning, it would have burned. Instead, by adding it at the end, after all the ingredients have gone, it will give its flavor, it will infuse it, but it will not be overtaking the dish. You also notice that I'm cooking this in a saucepan, unusual uh, for this particular type of thing. The reason why is because I love stirring about, I love interacting with the dish, and also this prevents for the Brussels sprouts during this process to jump outside of the pan. I find this to be very, very helpful to me. At this point, as you can see, they're softened up quite a bit, and I add a little bit of chicken stock now. Perfect. This needs a few more minutes to cook and complete, so why don't we do this? I'm gonna put this aside, and while the Brussels sprouts are cooking, I'm gonna show you how to make a sandwich. So what we're going to do, we're gonna cook the salmon on medium heat, but I have preheated the pan to high heat. I've just reduced down the heat because I want the first contact to give it a nice sear. All that I've done with the salmon is just salt and pepper. I personally find that you can still get a nice little bit of browning on the outside, but by cooking it longer on a lower heat, you maintain the juiciness of the fish. And that to me is the most important thing. Now we're ready to turn it to the other side. Ah, beautiful. This is exactly the browning I was looking for. Now, here comes the magic. And this magic is a technique that the French chef called arrosé. So in spite of the fact that we have olive oil in there, we do add now a little piece of butter. We let the butter melt into the pan. So I tilt the pan toward me and I bathe it. Look at that. Look at that, mamma mia che bellezza. Guarda. Now I get passionate about this because I know that this butter is now penetrating all the way through into the salmon. As you can see right in here on the split that has taken place, the butter is going straight into every fiber of it. And the way the salmon will taste once I serve it to you, it will be a, something that you never had before. Look at the perfect crust up at the top and the tenderness that still is. Oh, mamma mia. To have a figure in mind when you cook the salmon, always keep in mind this. A salmon like this, of this side, a piece of this shape, will take about three minutes per side to cook perfect. Once you cook the salmon exactly three minutes per side, turn off the heat. Now, there's one more thing that I need to do with the Brussels sprouts, and then we're ready to plate it. All right. The Brussels sprouts are perfectly done. As you can see, all the chicken stock that was left in there has evaporated, that's why we added just a little bit. And now you can see how nice and soft we are. The last bit of addition is a little bit of butter. Just to increase a little bit more of the flavor to it. If you wanted to at this point, you could even use and add a little bit of Parmesan cheese. It would go wonderful, even with this recipe. The Brussels sprout is perfect. The fish is perfect. We have the red wine sauce ready to go. Ready to play. Let me show you. And when it finally comes to plating, think of yourself as a painter. Think of yourself as an artist who is deploying, demonstrating the beauty of the art that is just created within the assembly of each one of the ingredients on the plate in a way that is enchanting. Sometimes the most beautiful things in life are the simple ones. And I hope that this dish that came from my heart, from my soul, from my mind, from my passion, will inspire you to turn your kitchen 
into your favorite restaurant. And this is how you make salmon with Brussels sprouts and bacon and red wine sauce. My wife says, I like you better when you just started out. I says, why? I'm better now. I say, yeah, the flavors are better. But the food always comes out cold. It takes you forever for you to do the plating. What do you do that? And I say, honey, I'm sacrificing myself and you for our art. If I'm going to do a TV show about cooking, you got to know what it looks great. And if the payoff is that you got to eat it lukewarm, so be it. I don't think she has forgiven me yet. No, I don't think she has. Emotion? Then life would have been perfect. I must say that after many years of working on TV, I can actually edit myself on call to the most minimalistic sound that could be imperviously disturbing within the context of an interview such as this. And I find inside of me this genius that goes untapped. I deserve more than just an Emmy. I think an Oscar should be in the duel. <laughs>